cái đèn mỹ thuật của hướng nhà hậu quá bề đã nha Chi mà năm năm ngồi mình làm mà Có chứ, có kiểm hòn chứ Kiến đáy bấu bấu hộ dưỡng kia Đâu hết chuyện hả? thương làm gì mà lái làm gì tự nhiên sắp cái giữ mình mình buồn đó rồi nó mà giữ mình nói chứ thì nó hoạt đau có tình
cái đừng xếp vô đó để thì sao không đưa ái cái kia không luôn đi Bây giờ này ráng đỏ cho chị cái kim mang kiến hả cho chị cái kim kim à của em ta mấy không bảo hành không dán tay <cười>
là cái là cái gió gió tay nhưng mà gió 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 Đi nè, câu hồ môn thưởng chở tấn ráp vô á BBC Motor Reviews Channel Honda Valkyrie F6C, 1996 to 2005, Review Basically a stripped-down Honda GL 1500 Gold Wing, with lower gearing and six carbs, the Honda F6C Valkyrie is actually reasonably good fun to ride and some might say it's best made motorcycle in America. The Honda Rune 1800 looks like some kind of Dan Dare spacecraft, mental. Ride quality and brakes. Here, the Honda F6C Valkyrie surprises many riders. So long as there's plenty of advanced planning, the motorcycle can be made to go around a corner fairly fast, for a cruiser, and still offers a luxurious ride on motorways. The Honda Rune 1800 is more ponderous, but then you'd want to travel slowly so people could stare for longer. The Honda Valkyrie's big problem for many cruiser riders is that it just isn't a V-twin. Instead a burbling flat 6 Honda GL 1500 Gold Wing motor seems to sanitized for most, too damn quiet. Sure, the Honda F6C Valkyrie's 100 brake horsepower motor is enough to send the thing whizzing along in unfeasible speeds, but it's easily out-accelerated by the Triumph Rocket 3 any old Yamaha VMAX and a whole boatload of rival power cruiser motorcycles these days. The Rune 1800 isn't really any faster. The Honda F6C Valkyrie rarely goes wrong, ever. It is a beautifully made motorcycle, with lavish chrome, thick paintwork and an engine that can cover 100,000 miles with basic oil-slash-filter changes. The main problem with the motorcycle is keeping its hundreds of nooks and crannies clean. Double that cleaning time on the Honda Rune 1800. Our Honda Valkyrie FC6 owners reviews show a very reliable bike, which is the norm for Hondas. 
for most of its life it was available as a personal import from the USA, and there aren't that many around, which keeps resale values high. Honda F6C Valkyrie motorcycles with the hard luggage touring kit on seem to be sought after. Buy a good used motorcycle and you can 5 years biking for about 2 grand in depreciation. The Honda Rune 1800 costs big bucks and is for lotto millionaires and posers only. Huge brakes, beefy forks and a proper two-person saddle are some of the useful features on the Honda F6C Valkyrie. It could use the reverse gear of the gold wing and there's no screen as standard on the Honda F6C Valkyrie. Naturally there's a whole phone book of accessories to be had, from both Honda and US aftermarket motorcycle accessory suppliers. Sci-fi bodywork on the room looks stunning. Welcome to BBC Motor Reviews Channel. KTM 1090 Adventure, 2017 on, Review. The chassis copes with the extra power with ease, in fact it feels like it could handle a further 25 brake horsepower. The conventional 48mm WP forks and WP rear shock work straight out of the box. The forks are non-adjustable but on our test route that didn't pose any problems. A 170 section rear tire and the 1090's relatively low weight enable it to be hustled with ease. Boring it certainly isn't. Unfortunately, we had less than ideal conditions to test the new 1090 but wet riding did highlight the bike's rider friendliness and near perfect fueling at low speeds. There are three riding modes, sport, street, and rain with an optional off-road setting. Each mode changes the engine characteristics and level of traction control intervention. Although it's called the 1090, the engine is the same 1050 cubic centimeters motor as used in the outgoing 1050 Adventure. In the old model KTM restricted it to 95 brake horsepower, but they've unleashed an extra 30 brake horsepower for the 1090 pushing peak power to 125 brake horsepower and torque to 80.4 FTLB. On the road it deals like KTM have thrown a bottle of vodka into the punch bowl along with a dozen cans of Red Bull. The 1090 is much livelier and more fun to ride yet still has the ease of use of the original 1050. Confusingly KTM also offer a 95 brake horsepower version of the 1090 which can then be restricted further to 47 brake horsepower for those on an A2 license. KTM's LC8 engine is a proven motor by now, with few problems to report and KTM's Adventure family are well built. The 1090 Adventure comes in much cheaper than the more premium competition, without skimping on quality. The standard price of £11,299 is good value although the bike we tested would have cost £12,800. As the 1090 is the baby of the adventure range the spec doesn't quite match that of its bigger brothers, but you do get three riding modes as standard, sport, street and rain. An off-road setting can be unlocked with the optional off-road pack, £243.78. Traction control and ABS are standard but not lean sensitive and the TC can't be deactivated on the move. Old style clocks remain. Welcome to BBC Motor Reviews Channel. Sinis Akumo 125, 2022 on, review. Priced at £2,599 the Akuma significantly undercuts the popular Honda MSX 125 Grom, which is its obvious target. And though my preference is for traditional looking bikes with a retro feel, like the WK Scrambler or Cine's own Outlaw, after riding the updated Akuma I'm genuinely impressed. Ride quality and handling are altogether spot on, and though not the outright fastest it's plenty quick enough. Yes, perhaps the seat leans you a bit too far forwards and at 6 foot tall my knees are a bit high but this aggressive style and involving feel make the Akuma a confidence-inspiring and solid first ride for any newcomer. If I wasn't a skint student on part-time wages, I'd buy one without a moment's hesitation. Can't say much more than that. For 2022 the Cines has larger 14 inches wheels, upgraded from the previous 12 inches. Still small, they improve handling and give a stable feel around corners 
while still making the Akuma very agile at low speed and in close quarters. The handling is smooth too, thanks to the suspension and low center of gravity, and with the seat pushing you forwards you can really feel every inch the bike. Leaning forwards into corners and tucking in on the straights, the Akuma might be a modern monkey bike but rides like, well, a proper bike. They call it the Mini Monster and it deserves the nickname, being a down-to-earth yet modern bike that both looks and rides the part. Being angled steeply forward means the seat does affect comfort, and with the abrupt shape of the tank you need to be gentle with the brakes. The Akuma is also very compact, it's physically smaller than my own WK Scrambler 50. However, although perhaps better suited to smaller riders, with its 820mm seat height the Cinnies happily supports 6 feet of teenager. Both the front and rear brakes very good, and they're combined which means the front is linked to the rear. There's no ABS, however. Being air-cooled instead of liquid-cooled doesn't really match the modern style of the Akuma, and with 9.7 brake horsepower it's not as powerful as other more modern bikes. However, this also means welcome simplicity and you'll get your money's worth of reliability. It's also fast enough. Accelerating sharply and with a more than adequate 67 miles per hour indicated top speed, the Akuma feels swift and has the smoothest, easiest gear change of any 125 cubic centimeters bike I've ridden. Most noticeable of all the Akuma's features is the three-tiered exhaust. It's not just an eye-catching MV Augusta styling trick, but three fully functioning pipes that sound ace as well as looking great. With aggressive shapes, new blacked-out finishes, steel trellis frame, which is non-structural, and its raised tank giving the look of an arched back and so resembling a big cat, go on, imagine, riding the Akuma makes me feel like I stand out from the crowd. Which is important for the teenage market. Switch gear, components and overall finish look and feel pretty good for a two and a half grand bike. Some fasteners and smaller parts will need coating with anti-corrosion treatment for winter use, but that's true of some bikes costing five times as much. And overall the Cinnies does a good job of disproving preconceptions about cheap, flimsy Chinese bikes. Honda's trendy MSX 125 Grum costs £3,849. Yes, it's a bit nicer finished than the Cinnies and will hold its value better, but it's only got the same power and the extra £1,300 over the Akuma can be a big ask for a cash-strapped teen. Benelli's TNT 125 is also made in China and costs the same as the Cinnies. It's got a couple of horses more and a neat-looking trellis frame, but it's also a tad gaudy and in-your-face. Picking between them is as much down to their image and personal preference as anything else. Tech fan? You'll be interested to learn that the display now has multiple color options as well as brightness settings. At first, I thought it was just another knick-knack, however it is helpful especially in changing weather or when looking through a tinted visor. And it's like socks with days of the week on every day can be a new color. The display is also crystal clear and comes with a small array of function as expected, time, trip, odometer. Something that I quite like are the large buttons that the Cinnies uses. None of this tapping the wrong control malarkey, just big simple buttons, easy as you like. 2019, Cinnies Akuma launched late in the year as a 2020 model. Modern monkey bike with air-cooled 4-stroke single and 12-inch wheels. 2022, upgraded with larger wheels, jazzy new clocks, plus more refined styling and colors. Replacing the stock bike's KYB suspension, the SP features Gen 2 Olean semi-active suspension, NIX 30 SV forks and a TTX 36 SV shock, which automatically controls the damping levels while leaving spring preload manually adjustable. Featuring spool valves rather than traditional needles valves, which Olean's claim deliver faster adjustment and a more accurate responsiveness at the low and high ends of the adjustment range, the SP suspension can be set in one of three semi-active damping modes, A1, A2 or A3, or one of three manual setting, M1, M1 or M3.
which remove the semi-active function and allow fixed damping settings to be selected via the dash. An incredibly impressive system, the semi-active suspension responds to undulations in the road surface instantly, smoothing them out and making the SP feel like it is gliding over the bumps. Harsh ones still give you a kick, but unlike on a conventional system the semi-active damping instantly recovers and keeps the MT nicely composed, a feature that reduces its tendency to shake its head when exiting bends under hard acceleration. On the UK's roads, a2 is the best option for bumpy B-roads where a 1 suits fast smoother road better and a 3 is more for straight line cruising as when the pace ups it feels a bit soft at the rear end. And the SP's brakes are better too. Fitting braided steel lines can make a bike's brakes feel horribly dead at the lever as they lack rubber lines comforting initial squish, however on the SP there is still enough feel to allow you to apply small amounts of pressure accurately via the new Brembo Radial Master Cylinder. They don't scream race bike and aren't as fierce in their bite as some rival's setups but are fine for use on the road and it is great to see the SP and stock MT. Now featuring cornering ABS thanks to the addition of an IMU in this latest generation. Good and bad news with the new Euro 5 compliant engine. Starting with the good, thanks to the revised fuel injection system the throttle response is now smooth. In B mode, A mode is still a bit too aggressive for road use, and the crossplane's enhanced mid-range surge of power is staggering, as is the wonderful offbeat sound, which has been tuned through a new intake system, and feel. But despite lengthening its gearing, the MT remains a noticeably thirsty bike and recorded 41 miles per gallon on our test ride, which is what Yamaha claim but still equates to a range of just 155 miles until the 17-liter tank is empty. If you opt for the SP, alongside the Olean suspension you gain braided steel brake lines as standard as well as a three-piece belly cowl, black bars and levers and a stitched seat. Unlike the stock bike, which comes in three color options, cyan, blue and black, the SP is only available in Icon Performance and it also features a polished metal finish on its swing arm where the stock bike has a black painted one. Everything else, including the engine and electronics package, is identical between the two MT-10 models, which is good news for MT-10 owners but a bit disappointing for SP owners who may feel like they deserve something extra to brag about aside from suspension. Which brings up the question of price. The MT-10 SP costs £2,500 more than the stock MT-10 at £16,000, which is tantalizingly close, especially when you look at a finance package. On a PCP deal after a £3,000 area deposit, you are looking at paying about £35 a month more for the SP when compared to the stock bike. That's about the price of a takeaway meal for two every month, which seems a small sacrifice to gain that all-important Olean's bling. In terms of running costs, both the SP and stock MT-10 have the same poor fuel economy and cost roughly the same to insure and service, so that's not a factor in ownership, and the SP should hold its residual value a bit better. How does it stack up against its rivals? Very well. The SP is £16,000 where a Ducati Street Fighter V4 is £19,551 or £21,651 in S guise with semi-active suspension. The Aprilia Tuono V4 factory is £16,900, the KTM Super Duke EVO £17,899. Triumph Speed Triple 1200 RS 15,500 pounds, which lacks semi-active suspension, and the Kawasaki ZH2 SE 19,079 pounds. Sharing the same tech package as the stock MT, the SP is no less impressive when it comes to its safety assists. Thanks to a 6-axis IMU you get cornering ABS and TC as well as slide control and anti-wheelie that sit alongside an up-slash-down shifter, engine braking control, cruise control and variable power modes, all of which are controlled via the new 4.2-inch color TFT dash, which lacks connectivity. While the electronics perform faultlessly, and the quick shifter is excellent, it is tricky to see which of the various acronyms you are selecting should you wish to tweak their Welcome to BBC Motor Reviews channel.
Triumph Rocket 3, 2020 on, review. Suspension, steering and stopping are all worlds ahead of the previous Rocket 3, and as a result it now feels like a laughably large but comprehensively capable motorcycle, rather than a cartoon cruiser caricature. Related, 2020 Triumph Rocket 3 TFC News on MCN. First impressions might be dominated by the rocket's fast proportions and the curiosity factor of cramming a motor larger than a typical family car between two wheels, but after a day spent studying the quality details, experiencing the meticulously managed power and appreciating the enormous improvements and refinement, you walk away feeling thoroughly impressed. The new Rocket 3 is exciting, eye-catching, attention-grabbing and pulse-raising yet avoid straying into feeling frivolous, ridiculous, or pointless. Forget the previous Triumph Rocket 3's cumbersome bulk, heavy-handed handling, basic running gear and Romanesque name badge, the new Rocket 3's chassis is totally different. A cast aluminium spine frame replaces the old twin steel tubes, helping contribute to an incredible 40 kg saving over the previous bike, while steering geometry is sharper and the wheelbase is shorter. As a result the rocket now has a proper appetite for corners the old bike couldn't dream of. Turn in is easy, holding a line mid-corner needs little inside bar pressure, and flick flacking from full lean left to right, and still ending up where you intended, is absurdly accurate for a bike with a fueled weight north of 320 kilograms. Suspension is by Showa, with 47mm adjustable upside-down forks up front, and an adjustable monoshock monitoring the shaft drive. No electronic adjustment though, the clickers are all manual. The front's set pretty firm, meaning you can haul hard on the flagship Brembo Stylema front brakes, even the rear brake is a four-pot radially mounted caliper, to generate huge stopping force without the bike trying to tie itself in knots. Ride quality is generally good, though the short travel shock, just 107 millimeters, has to work hard and can feel bouncy. Drive hard and you can clearly feel the rear end of the bike jack up though, a result of the torque reaction from the shaft drive being unchecked by any kind of parallelogram setup. The Rocket 3 comes in two flavors, Roadster R and Touring GT, with the main difference being riding position. The R has a higher seat, mid-set foot pegs and narrower bars, giving a more aggressive street fighter stance while the GT's lower seat, feet forward controls and wider, higher bars give a relaxed, cruiser feel. Everything is transferable between the bikes, meaning you can create whatever kind of muscle power touring cruiser you like. Into the bin goes the Rocket 3's 2,294 cubic centimeters triple, replaced by this all-new, gruntier, smoother, cleaner, stronger and smaller 2,458 cubic centimeters engine. Huge 110.2 mm pistons eclipse the old 101.6 mm items, while stroke is significantly reduced, down from 94.3 to 85.9 mm, allowing Triumph to make a shorter motor. Peak torque is identical to the previous Rocket 3 Roadster, at 163 lbft, but the new motor holds onto that grunt for longer as revs climb. Where the previous rocket's torque curve fell away sharply above 2500 rpm, the new motor has a much fatter, flatter delivery. As a result, headline power is up to 165 brake horsepower. But as ludicrous as that might sound, the reality is that it's immensely easy to use. All that prodigious power is carefully controlled by the ride-by-wire throttle and predictive, lean-sensitive traction control while output is restricted in lower gears and top speed is electronically limited to 138 miles per hour. It's a beast, but one of those big, fluffy, gentle, cuddly chaps from a Disney film. The colossal torque spread means you can ride it however you like. Plunk it in one gear and dip into the immense grunt from 2500 to 5500 RPM if you're feeling lazy or chase the 7,000 RPM redline and work the new sweet shifting six-speed gearbox for maximum thrills. There's even an optional two-way quick shifter in Triumph's accessory catalog, if you like changing clutchlessly. It's a completely new machine from nose to tail, so only time and miles will deliver a verdict on reliability.
service intervals are set at a car like 10,000 miles, suggesting the motor is in a fairly mild state of tune and Triumph have confidence in it. Looking over the bike in the metal, everything appears high quality, as you'd expect for 20,000 pounds. The exhaust headers are a particular highlight, the welds look neat, while the hydroformed curves are apparently a huge pain to produce. Everything seems tucked away neatly, there are no vulgar cables or hoses dangling about anywhere, and wiring runs inside the handlebars. Details like the Monza-style petrol, coolant and oil filler caps are pleasing, while the clever flip-out pillion pegs are a neat design. Our Triumph Rocket 3 owners' reviews show there have been some issues for some buyers, in particular corrosion, electrical and mechanical problems. Seemingly the rear brake can often stop working, for example, and needs attention from a dealer. Have a good read through before going for a test ride. Clearly it's not a cheap bike, though an ultra-capacity extreme muscle cruiser never was going to be. The Rocket 3R is 19,500 pounds on the road, that includes almost all the gadgets, apart from the two-way quick shifter and the heated grips. The GT version which includes the heated grips, a fly screen and a pillion backrest, is 20,200 pounds. Both are roughly on a par with Ducati's Diavel 1260S, 20,041 pounds. A Harley-Davidson Fat Bob 114 starts at 15,825 pounds, but doesn't have a fraction of the Triumph's tech, torque, pose or poise. If you want to go properly left field, a Moto Guzzi MGX21 is 19,999 pounds. Running costs probably won't be any kinder on the wallet. Triumph claimed the motor returns 41 miles per gallon, but our test ride suggests it's closer to 35 miles per gallon. That 240 section, 16 inch rear tire isn't cheap either. Sign picking the bike up in March I have had a headlight replaced under warranty main beam sticking on, and the second which has really put me off was the rear brake losing all braking power. It has been back to my dealer who changed the fluid for a better one but was told that Triumph know there is an issue and they are working on it. I thought anything to do with brakes on a 163 pounds of torque monster would be the number one agenda. First service only. The fuel economy is not bad so far 43 to 45 miles per gallon. That is with occasional spirited riding thrown in. Two stars is because after six months I was offered £13,500 from the dealer to buy it back. Even WBAB offered considerably more, so not much faith in the brand and will likely be going back to BMW. Equipment The Brembo brakes are top-notch. The stopping power and feel is superb, the ride comfort is less so. I am a big old guy and no matter how I try to adjust the rear suspension the ride is harsh on anything but smooth tarmac. The roads in Herefordshire where I live are amongst the worst in the UK and back ache sets and after about 2 hours. I have purchased an Airhawk DS seat pad which has transformed the comfort but it's still not all day comfy like my old rocket. The tank is so wide you have to ride legs apart which at motorway speeds the wind blast makes your hips ache trying to keep tucked in. In the end I made and fitted a pair of Perspex front fork air deflectors to solve the discomfort. I didn't go for the quick shifter or the navigation package as for me they don't offer much in the way of the overall riding experience. The TFT display is good but on some settings it is too fussy and hard to read. I opt for the screen that shows speed, revs, gear selection and fuel status, that's enough for me. There are a few niggles with this bike that could be better. The original screen doesn't give much wind protection and the rear hugger design is total crap. In the rain you get covered in road crud halfway up your back. I bought an aftermarket hugger which left some wiring exposed so I ended up fitting this over the top of the original hugger, problem solved. I purchased the accessory panniers and rear rack to give the bike some touring capability. These panniers are okay but are quite small and are not as rigid as I would have liked. The optional rear rack is stated as only good for 3 kilograms, which means fitting my fully loaded Kuriakin Grand Tour bag on the rear may be more than it can withstand. 
Guess I will soon find out as there is little room on the pillion seat. One of the best design features on this bike are the fold-away pillion foot pegs and the folding pannier mounts. If anyone is thinking about buying this bike for some serious touring then you will need a few aftermarket bits to iron out its touring limitations. Welcome to BBC Motor Reviews Channel. Yamaha Phaser 600, 1998-2004, Review and Used Buying Guide. Related, Easy Fit Kit turns Yamaha Phaser 600 into retro race rep. In fact, since Yamaha stopped the FCS 600 Phasers production in 2003, it has taken them until the launch of the Tracer 700 to replicate the Phasers magic formula. However, in 1999 the Yamaha Phaser 600 was the best-selling bike in its class, and by 2002 the firm had sold over 83,000 units. There is a reason the Yamaha Phaser has such a strong following, as soon as its wheels start to turn you are right at home. It is ease personified and most of this warm feeling comes from the wonderful motor. With the Phaser, Yamaha got the basics right and that's what makes it such a great bike. The tank range is long, the seat comfortable, the fairing effective, the brake sharp and the motor strong in the mid-range and extremely reliable. The suspension may be a bit baggy, but if that's the Yamaha Phaser's only real fault 22 years after it was launched then that's not bad going. Useful Yamaha Phaser 600 specialists include www.foc-u.co.uk and yamahaclub.com. Read on for our full used buying guide. Ride quality and brakes. Launch impressions. When you push the Yamaha Phaser 600 to the limit, which is easy with those blue dot or one brakes up front, it dives a little bit and loads up the front end. It waggles a bit, but the handling is generally confidence inspiring and if you take it steady you could ride to Budapest on a Yamaha FCS 600 Phaser and feel no severe aches or pains. Yamaha Phaser 600, what does it ride like now? With limited suspension adjustment, post-2000 models have variable damping in their forks, the Yamaha Phaser is a bit wobbly in the corners and the Sumitomo calipers shared with the R1 quickly overwhelm the forks when you brake hard. But where on some bikes this is an annoyance, on the Phaser it makes you giggle and adds to the amusement factor. Airs just under 100 brake horsepower in the Yamaha FCS 600 Phasers detuned, Thundercat 600 cubic centimeters, for cylinder engine and that's plenty for backroad fun, as well as motorway commuting if needs be. The Yamaha FCS 600 Phaser delivers its power in a wide spread and the six-speed gearbox is there if you feel like playing tag with sports bikes. Yamaha Phaser 600, what's the drivetrain like now? The inline 4 is beautifully smooth and has that lovely mid-range pull you get with an old long-stroke unit. It's not revvy or buzzy like the FC6's engine, it's just silky smooth and full of drive. The gearbox may be showing its age, the linkage is notoriously sloppy when worn, but it clunks into gear with a reassuringly solid feel and the bike is more than happy to break the national speed limit when asked. The Yamaha Phaser is a fairly well-made motorcycle, and except for the black painted downpipes rotting away, or the brake calipers seizing up, the Yamaha Phaser doesn't suffer big problems. It can rack up very high miles with regular servicing. Apart from its thirst for fuel it would make a great dispatcher's motorcycle. Yamaha Phaser 600 Reliability We've got a whopping 52 Yamaha Phaser 600 owners reviews on the site and the bike scores 4.6 stars out of 5 overall, with the same score for build quality and reliability. This is an incredibly high score, meaning it's safe to say you can depend on the Phaser 600. Minor issues include the Phaser lacking more modern equipment such as more electronics, but this is an old bike now. You can't expect the world. Its value more than matches its spec. Yamaha Phaser 600 Common Problems Early ignition barrels aren't very strong. Check it works smoothly and that the ignition key works the fuel cap and seat lock. The headlight bracket bends if the bike is in an accident and few people replace it, so always check the fairing looks square on the bike. 
the steel swing arm can trap water and rot around the chain adjusters, so inspect this area well for any obvious rust damage. The Phaser has a 11070 front tire and as a result tire choice is limited. You can fit a 12070, but this can interfere with the Mudguard Yamaha Phaser 600, a mechanic's take. By Chris Spinks, Chief Instructor, Metropolis Training School. The key factor when buying a used FCS 600 phaser is seeing if it goes into second gear. First gear on the phaser is quite short and the jump to second puts a lot of strain on the gearbox. This can cause the second gear selector fork to bend and that leads to a really stiff change and eventually a broken gearbox. On a cheap bike such as a used phaser, that can write the bike off as replacing it is not economically viable as a complete gasket kit costs 500 pounds. That said, when I destroyed my phaser's gearbox on a track day I bought a new motor for 400 pounds and swapping them over was fairly simple. The sprocket retaining nut is a classic phaser fault and well documented. The nut comes loose, the sprocket slides off the shaft and then sits on the threaded part of the output shaft. People think the clutch is gone and rev the motor, which causes the sprocket to strip all the threads off the shaft. You can slide the sprocket back on and spot weld it in place, but you need to be careful not to overheat the seals. As long as you fit the nut correctly using the locking washer you should be fine, although Yamaha did release a deeper threaded nut and this sorts the issue. The lights on the phaser are poor, but on the 1998-9 model the bulb vibrates and creates a white powder that fills up the lenses. This is impossible to remove and makes the light even worse. Some owners change the loom to convert the phaser to twin headlights, which is very easy but you need to tilt the main beam down or it will fail an MOT. After 15,000 miles the shock will be duff. I'd recommend getting the forks rebuilt and buying an aftermarket shock. Don't be tempted to go for a stiff fork springs, I've found softer ones works better. When it comes to the finish the paint likes to flake off from the engine's fins, so don't jet wash the engine and check the downpipes. The motor is totally bulletproof, but the cam chain tensioner can need changing and it is a nightmare to get to. At the end of the day, a well-looked after phaser is a brilliant buy and totally reliable. At the training school we would see them cover over 65,000 trouble-free miles with only oil changes. Extrema Makeover, Aprilia put the RS660 on a diet for a limited edition focused model. Alongside the surprise launch of their 2023 BX450, Bimota have shed more light on supercharged Tessie Tour currently in development. Now officially called the Terra. We first caught glimpse of the bike as a basic design sketch at the 2021 ICMA show, with a spokesperson for the Rimini firm later confirming to MCN that it would be powered by the four-cylinder motor found in Kawasaki's Ninja H2SX range. Never before have Bimota been present in this market segment Bimota COO, Pierluigi Marconi, said in a statement. No one has this much fun and function in one package. The Terra is an attention grabber that will act like a halo for Bimota by attracting further consumer attention to our impressive vehicle lineup, he continued. Although details remain scarce, Bimota have gone into some depth on the new steering system, which sits diagonally between a front subframe and the front wheel. There are no front forks like a conventional motorcycle, which should aid front end stability and the ability to trail brake into a corner. This is because braking forces are kept away from the front suspension, leaving it free to deal with bumps in the road. These systems can reduce front-end feel though. Until now, Tessies were only made for the sports segment, Marconi told MCN at ICMA 2021, we'd like to put the Tessie name to adventurers, tourers, and bikes like that. Our philosophy is to have two lines of bikes, he added. One is the Tessie line and one is for more traditional models. We like to follow the two concepts, because although a Tessie chassis has a lot of advantages, for some riders it is still too much of a novelty. Alongside the funny front end, Bimota have also confirmed that the Terra will receive semi-active suspension developed in partnership with Marzaki. The ride height can also be adjusted either manually or electronically by 30mm.
Also expect to find 5-spoke forged alloy wheels too, which should help to keep unsprung mass down. It went from first sketch to full-size model in few months using computer-aided design, Marconi continued. You ride some bikes because you have to, but you ride these by moto because you want to. Terra will appeal to enthusiasts of all ages because the design draws you in, and the performance keeps you there. Superior Performance Brof Step Up Aston Martin Partnership with More Powerful AMB001 Pro Luxury boutique brand Brof Superior have once again teamed up with supercar experts Aston Martin to create yet another outrageous, limited-run track day machine. The AMB001 Pro made its debut at the EICMA trade show in Milan and follows in the footsteps of the first-generation €98,000 AMB001 which entered the public consciousness back in autumn 2019 and has since sold out. The standard track-only 001 features a turbocharged 997 cubic centimeters liquid-cooled V-twin engine that sits as a stressed member in the chassis. The 175 kilograms, dry, Pro uses a CNC machine version of this unit as a stressed member with a claimed 25% increase in power to 221.9 brake horsepower. There's also carbon fiber bodywork said to be inspired by Aston Martin's 1000 brake horsepower Cosworth built 6.5 liter V12 Valkyrie AMR Pro hypercar. The success of its predecessor, coupled with the incredible Aston Martin Valkyrie AMR Pro, inspired us to get together again to create a new superbike, one that we know will excite our customers, Brof Superior CEO Thierry Henriette said. We are particularly proud of the new engine type, with a crankcase fully machined from solid billet aluminium, which is a unique feature for a production motorcycle. With the marked increase in power this takes AMB001 Pro into the hyperbike sector. Machined from AL5000 solid billet aluminium alloy, the uprated motor also gets a new cylinder design, with wet cylinder liners for greater cooling, which should help with the longevity over prolonged hard use. Limited to 88 units in total, the Pro will not be homologated for the road and will be built by hand at the Bra factory in Toulouse, France. Orders are now being taken, with the first deliveries expected in the final quarter of 2023. The bike shown at ICMA was a prototype. It's a beautifully simple formula. Form plus technology equals performance, Merrick Reichman, executive vice president and chief creative officer of Aston Martin, said. We've achieved this fluidity again with Brof Superior for those who desire a track superbike like none other. The rider is part of this moving sculpture and will literally feel as though they are part of the track when laying atop the AMB001 Pro. But it's not all about engine performance. A quick glance at the side profile of the Pro reveals more extreme bodywork, with a more pronounced tail, winglets, and a rear carbon disc wheel design. There's still next to no front wind protection though, which could be unpleasant at speed and take away from the riding experience. Gone is the underslung exhaust exit from the standard 0012, with a single pipe on the right side of the bike protruding above the fat 200 section rear tire and shark like aero wing. In a nod to Aston Martin's racing success, the 001 Pro features a striking jade green livery, with a blacked out motor and suspension. This suspension system comes in the form of a front double wishbone setup adjustable for preload and rebound plus a rebound and preload adjustable monoshock. Naked Ambition, CF Moto Unveil NKC22 Concept CF Moto weren't sure of new bikes to show us at the EICMA trade show in Milan, including this naked roadster concept called the NKC22. The bike uses an 800 cubic centimeters parallel twin engine, presumably the same KTM 790 lump used in Kfmoto's 800 metric tons models but wrapped in a lightweight, sporty chassis. This concept version is covered in forged carbon bodywork with an engine fairing that doubles up as an aerodynamic wing. Front forks are heavy-duty upside-down units and look to be fully adjustable while at the back a stylish single-sided swing arm holds a rear wheel blanked off with carbon inserts. 
CF Moto reside at the economical end of the motorcycle market, and so even this concept version gets J.1 brakes rather than the full Brembos used on last year's track focused SRC21 concept. Twin SC Project exhausts complete the aggressive, sporty look and would, from the looks of them, far exceed UK homologation noise limits, so expect something more sensible on the finished bike. The M button on the left switchgear and the word street on the bottom of the TFT dash display suggest that a selection of rider modes is available with up and down buttons for cruise control also included. And the telltale phone symbol elsewhere on the screen means there's smartphone connectivity, too. CF Moto reside at the economical end of the motorcycle market, and so even this concept version gets J.1 brakes rather than the full Brembos used on last year's track focused SRC21 concept. Twin SC Project exhausts complete the aggressive, sporty look and would, from the looks of them, far exceed UK homologation noise limits, so expect something more sensible on the finished bike. The M button on the left switchgear and the word street on the bottom of the TFT dash display suggest that a selection of rider modes is available with up and down buttons for cruise control also included. And the telltale phone symbol elsewhere on the screen means there's smartphone connectivity, too. Naked Ambition, CF Moto Unveil NKC22 Concept CF Moto weren't short of new bikes to show us at the ICMA trade show in Milan, including this naked roadster concept called the NKC22. The bike uses an 800 cubic centimeters parallel twin engine, presumably the same KTM 790 lump used in Kfmoto's 800 metric tons models, but wrapped in a lightweight, sporty chassis. This concept version is covered in forged carbon bodywork with an engine fairing that doubles up as an aerodynamic wing. Front forks are heavy-duty upside-down units and look to be fully adjustable while at the back a stylish single-sided swing arm holds a rear wheel blanked off with carbon inserts. CF Moto reside at the economical end of the motorcycle market and so even this concept version gets J.1 brakes rather than the full Brembos used on last year's track-focused SRC21 concept. Twin SC Project exhausts complete the aggressive, sporty look and would, from the looks of them, far exceed UK homologation noise limits, so expect something more sensible on the finished bike. The M button on the left switchgear and the word street on the bottom of the TFT dash display suggest that a selection of rider modes is available with up and down buttons for cruise control also included. And the telltale phone symbol elsewhere on the screen means there's smartphone connectivity, too. CF Moto reside at the economical end of the motorcycle market and so even this concept version gets J.1 brakes rather than the full Brembos used on last year's track-focused SRC21 concept. Twin SC Project exhausts complete the aggressive, sporty look and would, from the looks of them, far exceed UK homologation noise limits, so expect something more sensible on the finished bike. The M button on the left switchgear and the word street on the bottom of the TFT dash display suggest that a selection of rider modes is available with up and down buttons for cruise control also included. And the telltale phone symbol elsewhere on the screen means there's smartphone connectivity, too. Fantic released their first twin, the Caballero 700 Scrambler. Fantic has revealed their first modern-era twin-cylinder machine with a 700 cubic centimeters scrambler joining their Caballero range. Fantic are making the most of their partnership with Yamaha, announced at the beginning of 2021, as the bike uses the 689 cubic centimeters, liquid-cooled Euro 5 engine seen in the MT-07, Tenera 700, and R7. There has been no retuning of the CP2 twin either as Fantic claim the Caballero will hit the showrooms in April next year boasting 75 brake horsepower and around 50 lb.ft of torque, identical to the R7 and considerably more than the 40 brake horsepower and 31 lb.ft of torque of the Caballero 500 Scrambler. Elsewhere the 700 sports the same 19 inches front and 17 inches rear, aluminium, spoked wheels as its small capacity sibling. The engine sits in a single backbone style frame made from CRMO steel attached to an aluminium swing arm, 
giving it a wheelbase of 1,460 mm, 35 mm longer than the 500 version. One of the most immediately obvious differences between the two capacity scramblers is the exhaust system. The new 2 into 1 into 2 setup runs under the engine, over the swing arm to exit in roughly the same position. Both machines have a seat height of around 830 mm. Connecting frame to wheel will be a 45 mm upside down fork made by VRM Marzaki. The Italian manufacturer also supplies the rear monoshock with preload adjustment. Brembo is the manufacturer of choice for the calipers, with a four piston unit gripping the 330 mm front disc and a two piston, 245 mm setup on the rear. In another first for Fantic, cornering ABS will be standard on the 700. The system will sense the bike's lean angle and fine tune the braking response accordingly. Traction control also makes its debut to the Fantic lineup, with both rider aids and three rider modes, road, off-road and custom, manipulated via a 3.5 inches TFT display with Bluetooth connectivity. A 14-liter fuel tank may be a little on the small side, although the claimed 180 kg curb weight should prove competitive when it comes to commuting or a bit of back lane scratching. An expected price tag of around £9,000 may put some off, although stylish looks, proven engine and handling potential could tempt many. Stuart Prestige By Stuart Prestige All-weather rider with a penchant for long tours and hours in the saddle. You may also like Honda released £30,000 limited edition McGinnis 100th TT Star Replica Fireblade SP Who do you think you are, John McGinnis? Well now you really can live out your TT fantasies, as Honda reveal they will build 30 examples of this CBR1000RRR Fireblade SP John McGuinness 100th TT Start Replica Edition in celebration of the road racing legend's phenomenal accomplishments on the island. The headline visual difference from the stock bike is the bold replica of the paint job John raced with for his 100th TT start. But this is more than just a replica paint job, there's a whole host of other upgrades to add to the exclusivity. The stars align for me to be back on a Honda Fireblade for my 100th TT start, says McGinnis. It's an awesome bike and has meant so much to me over my career. I'm proud of my connection with its place in TT history and of this, my replica. John McGinnis is the second most successful TT racer of all time, next to the late, great Joey Dunlop, and while revered as road racing legend, he has also had an exceptional short circuit career, having raced in 24-hour world endurance races like the Bull Door and Le Mans, 500 cubic centimeters GPs and the Daytona 200. He's a former British 250 cubic centimeters champion, has ridden in World Super Sport and finished third in the 2009 British Super Stock Championship. Making his TT debut in 1996, he won the best newcomer title in the 250 cubic centimeters class. Three years later, he took his first win, the 250 cubic centimeters lightweight TT. Over the ensuing two decades, 1999 to 2019, he has accumulated an incredible 47 podiums and 23 TT wins as well as being the first to break the 130 miles per hour lap barrier on a Honda Fireblade, no less. So, what do you get for your 30,000 pounds? In addition to the already high spec of the CBR1000RRR Fireblade SP which underpins the replica, the limited edition blade gets a full replica paint job incorporating gold detailing and a film strip showing all of John's TT starts on Hondas, unsurprisingly. This is where it deviates from his actual race bike, which also pictured his TTs on other manufacturers' bikes, and 100th start sponsor logos. There are gold wheel stripes, an individually numbered plaque on the headstock, genuine Honda carbon fiber front mudguard and carbon rear hugger, a rear seat cowl and tall screen, and Metzeler Race Tech RR tires. On startup there's a ring of fire screen animation as the display loads and 30th anniversary logos on the smart key and laser engraved on the Akrapovic muffler, marking the machine's special place in Honda history. 
and to cap it all, there's John's signature on the airbox cover. Honda are even offering the opportunity for a personal handover from John McGuinness MBE himself, at Honda Racing UK in Louth. If that's not enough, you'll also get a custom Fireblade garage mat, genuine Honda accessories indoor bike cover, 3D laser engraved crystal featuring a design of the John McGuinness 100th start replica. All inquires and orders for the John McGuinness CBR1000RR or Fireblade SP100 start replica are to be via the Honda dealer network, and if you want to see one in the flesh, it will be on display on the Honda stand throughout Motorcycle Live at the NEC from November 19th to 27th. Fantic released their first twin, the Caballero 700 Scrambler. Fantic has revealed their first modern-era twin-cylinder machine with a 700 cubic centimeters scrambler joining their Caballero range. Fantic are making the most of their partnership with Yamaha, announced at the beginning of 2021, as the bike uses the 689 cubic centimeters, liquid-cooled Euro 5 engine seen in the MT-07, Tenera 700, and R7. There has been no retuning of the CP2 twin either as Fantic claim the Caballero will hit the showrooms in April next year boasting 75 brake horsepower and around 50 lb.ft of torque, identical to the R7 and considerably more than the 40 brake horsepower and 31 lb.ft of torque of the Caballero 500 Scrambler. Elsewhere the 700 sports the same 19 inches front and 17 inches rear, aluminium, spoked wheels as its small capacity sibling. The engine sits in a single backbone style frame made from CRMO steel attached to an aluminium swing arm, giving it a wheelbase of 1,460 mm, 35 mm longer than the 500 version. One of the most immediately obvious differences between the two capacity scramblers is the exhaust system. The new 2 into 1 into 2 setup runs under the engine, over the swing arm to exit in roughly the same position. Both machines have a seat height of around 830 mm. Connecting frame to wheel will be a 45 mm upside down fork made by VRM Marzaki. The Italian manufacturer also supplies the rear monoshock with preload adjustment. Brembo is the manufacturer of choice for the calipers, with a four-piston unit gripping the 330mm front disc and a two-piston, 245mm setup on the rear. In another first for Fantic, cornering ABS will be standard on the 700. The system will sense the bike's lean angle and fine-tune the braking response accordingly. Traction control also makes its debut to the Fantic lineup, with both rider aids and three rider modes, road, off-road and custom, manipulated via a 3.5 inches TFT display with Bluetooth connectivity. A 14-liter fuel tank may be a little on the small side, although the claimed 180 kg curb weight should prove competitive when it comes to commuting or a bit of back lane scratching. An expected price tag of around £9,000 may put some off, although stylish looks, proven engine and handling potential could tempt many. Stuart Prestige By Stuart Prestige All-weather rider with a penchant for long tours and hours in the saddle. You may also like 70s Superbike Stunner, MV Augusta Supervelis 1000 Serie Oro MV Augusta may not have been directly participating in the EICMA show in Milan last week, but it didn't stop them stealing the headlines with this stunning Super Velis Serie Oro. The carbon-clad superbike uses the Brute Ale 1000 RR as a base, meaning the same 998 cubic centimeters in line 4 producing a claimed 209.1 brake horsepower with a race kit installed. Inside this motor, you'll find a countershaft that rotates at twice the speed of the primary drive shaft with the aim of reducing vibrations and promoting faster cornering. You also get the same frame and single-sided swing arm, but now clad in carbon fiber bodywork inspired by MV's 1972 500 GP racer. Sitting alongside the smaller, three-cylinder Supervelis 800, the Siri Oro is planned to hit dealers in the middle of next year at a price of approximately £50,000.
In total, 40 elements of the bike are finished in carbon fiber, including a set of winglets that MV claim produce 39.2 kilograms of downforce at 199 miles per hour. You also get carbon fiber disc brake covers, which attempt to pay tribute to the drum brakes of old whilst also cooling the calipers, essential on a bike capable of such high speeds. MV Augusta also claim the design allows air to flow around the brakes towards the coolant and oil radiators for better temperature control. There are air vents along the carbon fairings, too. Despite the superbike credentials, the Siri Oro has deliberately been made more comfortable and less extreme than traditional circuit stars and it features electronically adjustable Olean's NIX forks for a high-quality ride. They are matched to an Olean's TTX rear shock, which bolts directly to the swing arm. As you'd expect for a bike of this caliber, stopping power comes from premium Brembo Stylema monoblock calipers, which bite onto chunky front 320mm discs. You also get five-spoke forged aluminium rims, and four under-seat exhausts, just unlike the company's landmark F4. In addition there is a suite of lean-sensitive electronics, plus a 5.5 inches TFT color dash to control them, with the added option of mobile connectivity. Dan Sutherland By Dan Sutherland News Editor, Sports Bike Nut, and Racing Fan You may also like Moto Range Grows, Super Soko owners launch three new urban models at ICMA 2022. Electric scooter manufacturer of Moto, parent company of Super Soko, have had a busy year, releasing three new models at ICMA, including the 125 cubic centimeters comparable e-bike, the Vmoto Soko Stash. The release of the production model comes just a year after the unveiling of the prototype, with the bike so named due to its multifunctional storage compartment, housed in the fuel tank, large enough for a full-face helmet or other accessories. At its heart is an electric motor producing an average 8 kilowatts with a peak of 15 kilowatts. This propels the Vmoto Stash to a top speed of 75 miles per hour when the boost is deployed, 68 miles per hour is on tap without the boost. A 72V removable battery provides the juice and can be charged using a fast charger and a conventional 3-pin plug in 3.5 hours. Charging without the fast charger will take between 5 and 6 hours. No range specifications have been released but expect it to have the same 30-mile capacity of the Super Soko TS Street Hunter, which has the same top speed capability. A newly designed swing arm pivots off a solid, lightweight frame, driving a 17-inch rear wheel. A 17-incher is also fitted on the front and ABS disc braking is standard. A relatively tall seat height of 830 mm awaits the rider and the stash has a curb weight of 143 kg. The company also unveiled their first dirt bike style machine, which weighs in at just 84 kg. The machine comes in two models, the Vmoto on R, which comes with road tires, or the OFFR, which is equipped with Nabla tires. The ONR slash OFFR can be set up in either L1 configuration, comparable to a 50 cubic centimeters machine or L3 which mimics a 125 cubic centimeters. In the L3 iteration the bike can reach speeds topping 50 miles per hour, while the L1 configuration limits the top end to just under 30 miles per hour. Moto claim a range of up to 90 miles with recharge times taking 2 hours for the L1 configuration and 3 hours for the speedier L3. A die-cast aluminium frame cradles the 8 kW motor producing a claimed 190 feet per pound of instant torque. A swing arm with a single rear damper secures the belt-driven, rear-spoked wheel. No retail price has been provided. The Vmoto Soko F01 scooter is Technically speaking, not a new bike as it was available as part of a commercial fleet, but now will be available to the general public, the company also announced at ICMA. The urban commuter will, like the on slash OFFR models, will be available as an L1 or L3 configuration. A 2 kilowatts or 4 kilowatts L1 and L3, 
motor will get the rider up to a maximum speed of 27 miles per hour for the L1 and 45 miles per hour for the L3 model. The moto claim a range of between 50 and 60 miles dependent upon the setup and riding style. The charging time of the removable battery is 3.5 hours with a fast charger using a domestic 3-pin plug or 6 hours without the fast charger. Coming in at 110 kg with a seat hay of 855 mm, the F01 should prove a popular choice for city transportation. The F01 will be available in white, light, or dark blue, red and black.